Another day begins as the sun rises over the Anduni plains. Here in Namibia, the sun grips the earth in its iron fist, burning and baking the land into submission through winter, summer, spring and autumn. In fact, it shines for more than 300 days each year. And then there is the Atlantic Ocean, with its Benguela current which originates deep within the Antarctic, bringing in and constantly washing icy seawaters onto the shores of the long Namibian coastline. The cold air that is blown inland is moist initially, but soon heats up and dries out during the day, as it is blown deeper into the interior. Namibia's severe climate is dominated by these two forces, the sun and the sea evidence of which can be found on the gravel plain stretching as much as 200 kilometers into the interior with the alternating diurnal cycle of hot to cold to hot quickly turns rock into sand. The result is a parched land of sandy deserts and gravelly plains over large areas of western Namibia. The harshness of the climate in these areas make them anything but ideal as habitats for living creatures, plant or animal. There is a tempering third force though. It is known by meteorologists as the intertropical convergence zone. In late summer, it moves from deep within Angola, situated immediately to the north of Namibia, southwards, bringing with it generous volumes of hot and moist tropical air. Most years, this moisture is discharged in the form of scattered but violent thunderstorms, which cause otherwise dry rivers to briefly flood turning the filth into a Garden of Eden. However, there are some years when this does not occur. The severe droughts that follow are what all living creatures in Namibia dread most. For any life, plant or animal, to be sustainable, it has had to learn to adapt to these extreme conditions. Historically, the harshness of the Namibian climate has prevented large numbers of people from ever settling there. Even today, the human population is still a mere 1.6 million in a country nearly four times larger than Britain. I am Rulan Yunus. With its low human population density, Namibia has thus, until recently, always provided a suitable harbour for hunter-gatherers where they could continue with their hunting and gathering practices without being influenced by the Neolithic and Industrial Revolutions. 
Even to this day, there are some hunter-gatherers who survive in Namibia as their pre-Neolithic forefathers did 10,000 years ago, as will be shown in this film. Such places where it is still possible to survive as true hunter-gatherers are truly becoming rare on our planet and moreover, it is expected that the hunter-gathering method of existence will become extinct within the next 10 to 20 years. In this film, I tried to document my search for the last remaining two hunter-gatherers of Namibia. I wanted to establish whether two hunter-gatherers still existed in Namibia and if so, their current social and economic status. It is common cause that our modern, growth-driven economies are putting far too much pressure on the Earth's available natural resources and that continuation thereof is simply not sustainable. I was hoping to gain a better insight into the way that hunter-gatherers impact on the environment, which is known to be minimal. I also wanted to learn firsthand how their quality of life compared to that of modern societies where the spatial population density is often hundreds of times higher. In short, I wanted to find out whether they were perhaps capable of maintaining an overall higher quality of life than their counterparts in the developed industrial world, without the environmental destruction concomitant to the latter. Prior to attempting a search for any hunter-gatherers, it's necessary first to understand the historical importance of the interaction that has been occurring between the hunter-gatherers of Africa and their Neolithic colleagues who in the drier parts of Africa at least were almost exclusively dependent on pastoral farming. Although domesticated camels and sheep were introduced into the rest of Africa from Egypt and domesticated goats from the Saudi Arabian Peninsula respectively some 8,000 years ago, it was the introduction of cattle from Egypt at roughly the same time that largely dominated the spread of Neolithics into Africa. Archaeological research indicates that at the end of the last ice age, approximately 8,000 years ago, the whole of sub-Saharan Africa was populated by hunter-gatherers, today collectively known as the sun. The term sun originally meant those without stock. The sun was not a uniform group and was known by many other names. It comprised numerous different subgroups which could vary in physical characteristics by as much as the tall, lean Ethiopians of today differ from the short pygmies of the Congo Basin. Numerous languages were spoken by the sun, but all contained the familiar clicking sounds of the Bushman languages. They all hunted and trapped game and gathered edible plant material, generally adopting a nomadic lifestyle, following the game that migrated to areas where it had reigned. With the advent of the Neolithic period, domesticated stock was, for the first time, introduced into Africa from the Middle East through Egypt. This was necessitated by the ever-increasing demand for food, dictated by the increasing human population. Soon, cattle farming, which was to dominate the scene for the next 8,000 years, began spreading southwards into southern Egypt and the Sudan. As the Nilotic peoples also adopted these new Neolithic practices. At roughly the same time, domesticated camels were being introduced from Southeast and Central Asia, allowing the drier parts of the Sahara Desert to be penetrated, so that by approximately 1000 BC, cattle farming had spread through all of the Sahara and into the west coast of Africa. At that time, the farmers from the north met with their hunting brothers from the south, over a broad front that spread from the Atlantic coast in the west to the Indian coast in the east. The lifestyle associated with cattle farming was in many ways diametrically opposed to that of hunter-gathering. The more assured food supply of the Neoliths allowed for larger and more permanent social communities which in turn required more permanent and stable water supplies. A clash of cultures was inevitable, 
with the hunter-gatherers on the losing side. The process of driving hunter-gatherers from their land continued unabated over the following 3,000 years. The savannas, with their good grazing and more ample water supplies, were the first to be colonized, leaving the drier desert and semi-desert areas and the impenetrable forests of the Congo Basin to the hunter-gatherers. The Bushmen of the Great Kalahari and the Pygmies of the Congo are examples. By 2000 AD, the process was almost complete. With the introduction of products from the industrial world, such as borehole drilling machines and road-making equipment, into Africa, the last of the remaining habitats suitable for the existence of a hunter-gatherer lifestyle are rapidly being destroyed. A good example is the Kalahari, which is fast being opened up for cattle farming, as more boreholes are sunk and cattle farms established, particularly in Botswana and Namibia. The colonization of Africa by cattle herding occurred in a number of identifiable phases. The first major thrust occurred westward in the direction of Morocco from Egypt, coinciding with the introduction of domesticated camels, with which Arab farmers could travel through the Sahara and also via the ancient maritime trade routes that had been established along the Mediterranean at that time. A second major thrust occurred when the Nilots, farming along the Nile, introduced cattle farming to their African neighbors in northern Sudan. They, in turn, managed to traverse the southern Saharan desert, also using camels, introducing cattle farming to the West African Bantu at Mount Cameroon. A third major thrust occurred when some of the Sun, who came into contact with the cattle farming Nilotes and the Sudanese, acquired and adopted the cattle farming skills of their neighbors. They had knowledge of the East African savannas and moved southwards to acquire new grazing fields. They became known as the Khoi or the Hottentot. The Khoi were nothing more than Sun who had exchanged the hunter-gatherer lifestyle for a pastoral one. They extended their farming activities to as far south at what is now known as Cape of Good Hope in the relatively short time span of 1500 years. The first three thrusts were all accompanied by people using bronze implements, the technology having been acquired from the Egyptians. The fourth, also a major but secondary thrust, occurred when the West African Bantu gradually expanded their cattle farming activities, first eastwards avoiding the dense forests of the Congo Basin, and later southwards into what today is known as Zambia, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Botswana, Namibia, and ultimately the northern and eastern parts of South Africa. By this time, West Africans had acquired knowledge of producing iron, the iron implements were superior in performance to the bronze implements, giving the West Africans an advantage over the Khoi and other cattle farmers who had already moved into the south of Africa from Egypt and the Sudan. This led to a large-scale displacement of the Khoi, forcing them eventually to move to the extreme southern corners of Africa. A fifth, smaller secondary thrust occurred along the western Atlantic coastline, through Angola and northern Namibia, where it eventually terminated against the Namib Desert. Currently not much knowledge exists about the history of this fifth thrust, except that it was also based on iron technology. Although some stock were also introduced into southern Africa by Europeans along the Atlantic Ocean coastline since the 1500s, and by Arab traders along the Indian Ocean coastline from even before that, these influences were relatively minor compared to that of the five major thrusts just described. Today, the only known populations of surviving near two hunter-gatherers, indicated in yellow on the map, are a number of scattered groups of pygmies living in the northeastern Congo, Rwanda, Burundi area, a small group of Hadzabi bushmen living near Lake Iyasi in Tanzania, and three groups of Kalahari bushmen, a few individuals living in the central Kalahari game reserve in Botswana, 
A small group living in the Aha Tadillo Hills area, also in Botswana, and a number of scattered groups living in the Tumque area, also known as Boschman Land in Namibia. There have also been reports of one small group of Kalahari Bushmen living in the southeastern Angolan province of Kwando Kubango, but it is not known whether they have survived the onslaught of the civil war there. In 2002, while on a trip to Namibia, I received information that a group of two hunter-gatherers may possibly be living in northwest Namibia. Interestingly, the information indicated that they were not of sun descent. The information was scanned and it was decided to go and search for them. The area of interest just south of the Angolan border is shown in red on this map. It lies within the area known as Kahoko land, meaning land void of water in the local Herero language. Zooming in on the area, there is Angola in the north and Namibia in the south. The perennial Kunini River, forming the border, originates in the Angolan highlands. It turns south near Ruakana and then west through desert and semi-desert for 250 kilometers, discharging into the Atlantic Ocean. The river forms the backbone of the cattle farming activities of the Himba, a tribal group well known for their nomadic lifestyle and general adaptation allowing them to survive in Kahoko land. In late summer they trek to areas receiving good rainfalls, staying in a series of elementary huts used over and over again season after season. As the field progressively deteriorates during winter, they return to the river where water and some grazing is always available. The Skeleton Coast National Park, almost completely desert, runs along the Atlantic coastline. Ipupa Falls is a well-known tourist stopover. Okongwati, a small village, is connected to Apuo, the capital, via gravel road. Food and liquor is obtainable, but the nearest fuel supply is more than 100 kilometers away. Swatboys Drift, the only other settlement of note, is accessible by a 4x4 vehicle and also frequented by tourists. My search began in December 2002, whilst traveling by 4x4 along the Kunini River between Swatboys Drift and Ipupa Falls. At a place called Nyandi, we stopped for coffee on the riverbank. A local inhabitant appeared from the bush. He spoke some understandable Afrikaans, introducing himself as Jalepa Jambiro from a subgroup of the Himba, the Vatwas. He told me about a group of Vatwas in the Zebra Mountains, just to the south from where we were. They hunted small game and collected food from the felt. They made their own hunting spear and arrow tips from iron, obtained by melting ore from the mountain. They did not allow their children near tourists traveling along the river to preserve their way of life. I was immediately interested. He said that he would take me there, but that I should come in winter, when it was cooler. I was only able to return the following winter season. I arrived one afternoon in July 2004, full of anticipation, accompanied by my wife and two Namibian friends. We set up camp on the banks of the Kunini River, where the Nyandi River joins the Kunini. Large crocodiles wander around the area at night, so we collected firewood to last the night. Some members appeared rather selective in the kind of firewood they collected. Just after sunset, a young Himba named Waterwa appeared from the bush. Although we did not share a language, we learned from him the shattering news that Jalepa Jambiro had died the previous year. We did not know the whereabouts of the hunter-gatherers, nor had we any knowledge of the Zebra Mountains, but were determined to continue with the search. Around the campfire, we therefore proceeded to plan a route into the mountains the following day using our topographical maps. The Zebra Mountains, rising 850 meters above the surrounding flatlands, 
comprise a complex series of mountains forming a rugged plateau 75 kilometers wide from west to east and 40 kilometers from north to south. It lies immediately to the south of the Konini River. Access is most difficult and temperatures soar during the day, even in winter. Its inaccessibility and lack of surface water makes it unsuitable for stock farming, except after heavy rains when the larger valleys offer limited grazing, which the Himbas exploit to the fullest. Our map showed the best access into the Zebra Mountains would be via the 30 kilometers long Inyandi River Valley, which cuts through the mountains in a north-south direction and would take us close to the remotest part of the mountains. Viewed from a distance, it was evident that a direct approach into the mountains would be difficult, as the slopes were extremely rugged. Was there potable water in the mountains in winter? If so, it would most likely be in the valley. We were able to carry water for five days, so we decided that we would venture into the mountains for not more than two and a half days to allow for a safe return. We would walk as far as we could in that time, then turn around. Hopefully we would find the hunter-gatherers before then. The satellite photo shows the Zebra Mountains, and in particular the Inyandi River Valley, more clearly. Early the next morning, as the sun rose, the Nyandi Valley formed a clear cutting into the mountainside. Whilst packing up, the young Himba appeared again. We managed to convey that we were planning a trip into the mountains and were looking for a guide. He immediately offered to act as our new guide, much to our relief as we did not know where to find water in the mountains. The language barrier prevented us from conveying the real purpose of our visit. While posing for the camera, as no doubt he had learned to do for tourists passing by, he suddenly called to his friend across the river, hey! in Angola, to come along. We set off in our car on the advice of our newly recruited guide to get us to the entrance to the valley. I immediately realized that Watero was under the impression that the car was an indestructible asset that could go anywhere, like an ox. After suffering a puncture and serious damage to a tyre the moment we left the 4x4 track, our approach became more cautious, avoiding hidden mopani tree stumps and sharp rocks in the felt. We followed an ancient cattle track, clearly leading towards the valley's entrance. We had to undertake some road building. It became impossible to travel further, so we parked the car under some dense bushes until we returned. I fixed the location using a GPS, should something happen to our guide. It took us three hours to complete the two kilometers traveled to the valley entrance. Approaching the valley, there was a sense of adventure. Very few Westerners have ever entered it.
We found these delicate green succulents growing close to the ground in an otherwise dry and barren terrain. Were they edible? The wideness of the valley surprised us. As the day went on, the sun became hotter. Combined with the very dry air, this was causing us to consume our precious drinking water at an alarming rate. Heavy grazing and browsing by cattle and goats was evident, definite signs of the presence of the himbas. On both sides, the mountainside rose belligerently into the sky. A wide variety of antelope species occur in the Zebra Mountains, but they are known to be very skittish due to hunting by the himbas. It includes Klipspringer, seen here, and species such as Kudu, Impala, Demora Dikdik, and Common Daker. Other species hunted include the Mountain Zebra. Deeper into the valley, there is a healthy population of leopards, the reason why the himbas don't take their goats deep into the valley. We came across some interesting smaller animals like this rock lizard. Notice how well its color blends in with the dead mopani leaves lying on the ground. The well-defined track that we were following, with meandering tracks running next to and roughly parallel to the main track, suggested that this area was still much used by the cattle farmers. We were relieved to reach open water after two hours of walking so that we could replenish our depleted supplies. The round hole in the sand was dug by humans to filter the water that percolated through. We could not but note the extremely small quantities of water that our guides required to satisfy their thirst. It was clear evidence of the advantages of having a black skin in the heat of the African sun. Excessive grazing exposed the bright white calcrete valley floor and the hot midday sun shone scorchingly on us. Exhaustion set in. After another four hours of walking through thick gravelly sand, we suddenly heard rosy-faced lovebirds, a sure sign of water nearby. The valley was narrowing and becoming less accessible, encouraging us, as this surely was suitable habitat for hunter-gatherers. Just before sunset, we finally reached water. We decided to set up camp here. According to Waterwa, we were now at a place called Onjima. With the narrowing down of the width of the valley, we sensed that we had by now penetrated deep into the mountains. We dug water holes, pitched tents, made a fire and prepared to settle in for the night before the sun set. A GPS reading indicated that we had now traveled some 14 kilometers into the Zebra Mountains. We decided to leave very early the next morning on the next leg of our trip so that we could get in as much walking as possible before the heat of the sun became unbearable. The valley opened up again shortly after we had left. We came across this abandoned kraal and typical Himba hut, confirming that the Himba were bringing their cattle as deep as this into the valley, where these local widenings occurred and where grazing was usually available. It was clear that we had to move further along into the valley if we were going to find hunter-gatherers. As the day wore on, we continued deeper into the valley. The strain was beginning to show as tempers flared. By now the valley had become consistently narrower with large and more rock boulders strewn across the riverbed. The sand had also become extremely gravelly, making walking much more difficult. After some six hours of continuous walking, we suddenly came across this makeshift hut constructed of palm leaves, 
the first sign of human presence in the valley that day. Shortly thereafter, we encountered this solitary man. Judging from his body ornaments, he may have been a hunter-gatherer, but we could not establish this fact because we were unable to communicate with him. We continued our search with renewed energy further into the valley. After two hours of hard walking and no further signs of human presence, we reached the next water hole, named Ombanji according to Waterwa. Water was available, but only from deep beneath the sand. We pitched our tents, enjoying the quiet. Unexpectedly, a lone dog came by and dug a deep hole in the sand to get to the water. Minutes afterwards, a small herd of cattle arrived. It then dawned on us that the animals belonged to the man that we had met earlier that day. Notice the behavior of the large ox. He was most uncomfortable with our presence and sensed danger. The cattle were pretty wild and not used to strangers being present in the area. As the other went to drink, the larger oxen stood guard, making sure that no surprises were sprung on them from behind. Lions are known to occur sporadically in the Zebra Mountains. A GPS fix indicated that we had walked 30 kilometers into the mountains, almost their full width, and although there were only three water sources, Access was still sufficiently easy, allowing Himbas to penetrate the valley with their small herds of cattle when grazing was good. We reluctantly had to admit to ourselves that we would probably not find any hunter-gatherers in the valley. It was now day three, and we decided to continue only a short distance along the course of the valley before turning back. In this area, the bush was dense and progress was slow. Rounding a bend, we suddenly came across three children playing in the sand. Notice the condition of the felt. When they saw us, they quickly disappeared behind the fence, enclosing the patch of Mahongo grain in the background. The children had left behind the wooden toy resembling a modern 4x4 vehicle, indicative of the lure of the products of the modern consumer age. and this perfect scaled replica of the makeshift hut that we had seen earlier. Surprisingly, we found no signs of cattle nearby, but the presence of a grain field indicated that the parents were non-nomadic agronomical farmers. We were running out of time and had virtually reached the end of the valley. It was time to turn back. We wanted to also get an idea of the conditions on top of the mountain plateau and whether that would be suitable to sustain hunter-gatherers. We therefore decided to follow a different route back, leaving the valley and going over the plateau. Again, we were not sure what to expect and were now even more concerned about the availability of water. Looking down on the valley below, it was clear that most of the moisture available from the soil occurred in the valley itself. Looking in the opposite direction, 
where our new route would take us, it was clear that the conditions on the plateau were much harsher. Stretching ahead of us were a number of smaller mountains that we would have to cross on our journey northwards back to the Konini River. After some three hours of walking through dense thorny scrub, we somewhat surprisingly again came across a group of red-faced lovebirds, this time sitting nearby in a tree. It meant that there must be water in the vicinity. We came across this baobab tree, which though normally occurring in hot, dry bushveld, is known to occur in areas with a good groundwater supply. Hunter-gatherers are known to cook the leaves as a green vegetable. The pulp surrounding the seeds is highly nutritious, rich in vitamin C, and the bark yields an excellent fiber used to make floor mats and is also used in traditional medicines. We also came across this magnificent specimen of a bottle tree, a truly endemic succulent of Cahoka land, the latex of which is used as an arrow poison. It was not long before we reached the small valley with larger and less scrubby trees, and the ground was covered with green grass, a rare occurrence in this rugged and dry terrain. We followed the course of a small valley until we reached an area where it widened slightly and suddenly there was free running water. As it was midday and the sun was burning fiercely, we decided to cool off and take a break. Interestingly, there was no evidence of the presence of cattle or goats, poor or dung, indicating that the stream had not recently been used by cattle farmers. The area presents an excellent base for hunter-gatherers with the only free running water within kilometers. There was much evidence of antelope spoor. The presence of fish in the ponds indicated permanent water. This was clearly an ideal spot for hunter-gatherers and yet there were none. Waterwa was beginning to sense that our mission had largely not been successful although he was still quite unsure about the reason for our trip. We had covered approximately 10 kilometers through the scrub dry land and were now only 6 kilometers from the Kunini River. The local name for the place was Papurawe. The chance of finding hunter-gatherers closer to the river was small as that area is known to be traditional cattle territory. We followed the course of the stream, which at some point disappeared underground, until we eventually reached the Konini River. We were met there by a group of Himbas, who were tending their cattle on the banks of the river. The Himba, who still live and farm in their traditional nomadic way, are increasingly coming in contact with modern man. The building of roads, the provision of permanent water supplies, increasing tourism and trade, all contribute to the rapid disappearance of their traditional culture. Although we had now returned to the Konini River, we were still approximately 14 kilometers from Inyandi, where our car was parked. We started walking again, along the river, back to fetch our car. We were disappointed on the one hand at not having found the hunter-gatherers that Jalepa Jambiro had referred to. Where were they to be found? However, we now had a much better idea of what conditions were like in the Zebra Mountains. I decided, therefore, that I would return the next year to continue my search for the elusive hunter-gatherers of the Zebra Mountains.